So let's see. We'll next turn to Jared DaCosta. Dr. DaCosta is a research chemist at the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command Chemical and Biological Center. See that acronym is CCDC CVC. Uh, and he's he leads the Biological Engineering for Applied Materials Solutions Program. His last 10 years of experience at CBC have been in the Chem Bioprotection and Decontamination Division, mainly focusing on novel materials development for the remediation of threats. His expertise is specifically in the incorporation of active decontamination materials into personal protective equipment through, material, uh, through materials engineering. He's been recognized for his work through awards, including the ACS Maryland Chemist of the Year and the Achievement Medal for Civilian Service. His work has always revolved around finding unique ways to progress science through working together, as evidenced in the pride he takes in aiding others through mentorship, encouraging collaboration, and developing opportunities to learn and evolve in the ever-changing scientific landscape. So I'll turn the time to you. Thank you so much. There we go. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, thank you, Becky. I appreciate that. This is great. I want to, again, thank the the organizers as George did. Um, you know, there aren't, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out now ways in this vir virtual uh, reality that we have going on here of ways to still connect and seeing that I saw over 70 people are watching this. Um, that's a lot more people than show up to some of the talks that we have in person. So I think this is a great way to, uh, to connect. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys today about um, ways that we're connecting synthetic biology with material science, um, specifically about some of the scaling um, aspects of it um, that you don't necessarily have to deal with on the biology side, but that come, become a real reality once you start dealing with um, actual material science. I have to figure out how to progress my slides. No. Okay. Um, so the uh, the as Becky said, I'm part of the Army Futures Command, um, the Combat Capabilities Development Command, Chemical Biological Center. It's a a real mouthful, but um, what our main mission is is protecting the warfighter and the soldier from um, chemical and biological threats. Um, some of the ways that we do this are things like gas masks, um, active decontamination like we have up here in the right. Um, down on the left, we're also known for obscurance and smoke screens. Um, and down on the lower right, we have um, some biological detection equipment down here. So um, any way that you can think of that the soldier would need to be protected from um, different threats um, that come from a chemical or biological nature, um, really that is what we do at our center. Um, when we came up with the, uh, the BEAMS program, which is Bioengineering for Applied Materials Solution, we started thinking we have a lot of folks at our center who are really good at chemistry, they're really good at material science, that are really good at biology, are really good at engineering, um, but there isn't anyone really bringing these aspects together. We had a, some biologists trying to do material science projects, we had some material scientists trying to do chemistry projects, and, and vice versa. Um, so our vision was how do we get all of these people to kind of come together, coalesce, and make something um, much better um, than, you know, than we can do playing in our own sandboxes. So out of that came the, uh, the BEAMS program. Um, and we, this revolved around three major aspects. Uh, one was human capital development. The second was laboratory infrastructure. And the third, and actually which was kind of the least um, large part of it, was the research program. Um, we recognized up front, you know, we always kind of as researchers think about what are the projects and what are the things that we want to come out of it, with sometimes letting these other two aspects that are incredibly important kind of um, go by the wayside. Um, so within our center, we wanted to make sure that we focused on these aspects as well. So first focusing on the human capital development, we actually started a uh, a lecture series. So this is very similar to what, you know, you would see in, in an academic setting. We thought, you know, if we want our material scientists and our bio biologists really talking together and understanding one another, they have to start um, kind of understanding some of the basics of what each other does. Um, a lot of us hadn't been, you know, in a classroom in 10, 15 years. 
um, and can't remember the last time, you know, it could have been the last time we took biology was in high school. Um, so if we got the experts at our own center to um, teach some of the, the basics and some of the things that they were doing uh, to each other, it, it would kind of open up some avenues. And, and that was kind of our, our hypothesis when we did it. Um, and we thought it was rather successful. Um, a lot of people up front said, you know, you can run these lectures, no one's going to show up to them, no one's going to care. Um, but, you know, people out of their own accord thought it was something different to do and thought it was something that was a change of pace and, and was really successful. Um, we had over 100 different people show up um, and we had about 500 seats filled. So, you know, you can see on average people are coming back to almost five of them. Um, and we recorded those lectures so our future kind of workforce could see them. And from that developed um, the second aspect of this, which was a laboratory competition. So we decided what could we do to get people's um, hands dirty in the area of synthetic biology and material science. Um, so we took the uh, G. xylenus bacteria, which can produce uh, nanocellulose, and we posed a question, which was basically, um, how can you, from a bac bacterial culture, develop the strongest nanocellulose and gave um, five different teams um, basically the course of 10 weeks to develop the strongest nanocellulose they could. Um, it was, again, a nice change of pace, gave something, people something different to do. It was a low risk environment um, where people got to collaborate with each other that wouldn't normally collaborate. Um, and people got to um, really experience something that was a little bit different and hands-on. Again, something that we don't typically do in government labs. Um, our second major investment was in the area of the laboratory infrastructure. Um, so our, our bio facilities are still are, um, pretty diverse at the Chem Bio Center. Um, we have fermentation processes that go all the way up to 1,500 liters, so pretty large. Um, we have downstream processing that can do things like purification, separation, cryopreservation. Um, we had folks with experience in phage scale up, and we could work all the way up to BSL-3 capabilities, which is obviously a lot different than other, uh, other labs. Um, but what we did to expand on some of our bi biological capabilities was we expanded in the area of our, of our uh, large-scale uh, facilities, so, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit down the road. We uh, invested in some large-scale biophilization equipment, and we invested in large-scale tube furnace, which is really a material science um, synthetic aspect, um, but it, I'll show you in a minute how it plays into our, our uh, biological uh, synthesis area. Um, and then we also recognize the fact that we have some pretty great capabilities at our center in material science. Um, just like you would at most universities, we have a variety of spectrometers, uh, diffractometers, microscopes, um, but we realized we didn't have uh, confocal microscopy um, abilities, so we invested some of our money in that area. But I'm sure what most people are interested in is what do we do on the research aspect, um, and this is where things started to like, really get interesting for us. So we invested in four major areas, um, four major projects that we've done, worked on over time. Uh, one is harnessing different biological pathways for molecular development. So we've um, developed, or we've worked on uh, biosynthesizing some porphyrin molecules that we've then used for photocatalytic degradation of chemical warfare agents. So that was something that was pretty unique that's come out of this program. Um, we've worked on novel ways of trapping enzymes inside of porous materials. Um, we've worked on bio biologically templated materials for plasmonics, so this is for obscuration. Um, but the one that I'm going to talk about the most is up here in the upper right here corner, um, and this is phage templated materials, carbon materials for filtration and gas storage. So um, what we've basically been able to do here is um, go through and take a, a virus and template a material onto the outside of it and um, scale it up and use it for protection applications that we're really interested in at the ChemBio Center. So where we started is we've, uh, we collaborated with um, Dr. Angie Belcher's lab at MIT, um, where she had already developed a bunch of different phage coated materials. Um, so they've been working with the M13 bacteria phage, which you can see here on the screen. It's about 880 nanometers in length and it's about six and a half nanometers across. Um, so these have a very high aspect ratio, which means they're much longer than they are uh, in diameter. Um, and the protein coat around the outside could be manipulated in different ways to react with different um, chemicals of interest to then create materials that we're interested in. At MIT, they had already kind of worked with a whole variety of different materials on the outside of the, the phage 
um, as you can kind of see here from energy storage applications all the way to making different catalysts and uh, magnets and, and solar and energy storage applications. Um, so they have this great kind of backbone of things that we could already work from and chemistries that we could already work from to um, really incorporate into the applications that we're interested in at the ChemBio Center. But what we were most interested in were carbon-based materials. So what they started with was they have um, the uh, genetically modified outer coat of the phage. Um, then you can react it with different uh, polymer precursors. And as you can kind of see here over on the right, we've worked with some different um, silicon oxide materials. Um, we've worked with things like resorcinol and formaldehyde to try to um, modify that outer poly polymeric coat. Uh, as you can see here in this, this pink box here in the middle. Then what we do is we burn it. We basically um, heat it up to about 1100 C um, and carbonize the material. And what this does is it makes a nice um, kind of um, a porous material where chemicals can, fill, can go in and out fairly easily and be filtered um, for things like gas, masks, gas mask applications and other filtration. Um, here's just another slide of just showing kind of the, um, the tailor ability. So depending on, on which polymer or precursors you incorporate in, you can get different types of polymers on the outside. Um, kind of down here in the upper, lower left, you can see the different, different colors, which kind of show the different chemistries that we can incorporate in. Um, but all of these materials get um, burned and carbonized first to create the nice high surface area materials. Um, depending on how we treat those materials um, depends on things like, uh, like the high surface area that we can get. So you can see some TEM micrographs here. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, we have uh, a material that only has about 400 meters squared per gram of, mat of material, which for a lot of people, that's actually considered a fairly high surface area material. Um, but compared to some of the, um, the carbons that we use right now and um, their efficiency for chemical filtration, this would be considered pretty low. Um, but down the lower left, when you heat at different temperatures and, and put, different, um, uh, put different moieties in there, you can get higher surface area materials up to 2,000 meters squared per gram, which this is a very, for us, a very nice high surface area material um, that should have fairly good chemical filtration properties. So what we did was we thought about what are the different applications that we can use these materials for at the ChemBio Center. Um, we came up with things like uh, incorporating them into textile, textiles for composite fibers, working with them for direct filtration replacement. Uh, we're also interested in things like oxygen storage. Um, so high surface area materials like um, these carbons can be used for storing gases. Um, and then we've also been thinking recently about things like dry decon powders. So if a soldier's out in the field and they potentially get exposed to something, they could spray themselves with a, a dry decon that might help um, decontaminate whatever they've been exposed to. Um, so at our, our lab, one of the um, techniques that we're most, uh, that we use very frequently for analyzing materials and their filtration um, efficacy is called micro breakthrough. Um, so basically what we do is um, right here, you can kind of see the sample holder in the middle. We pack in some, uh, a little bit of sample. We know how much is in there. Um, we expose it to a chemical over time and we get these, um, response curves. And basically by integrating over the curve, you can determine how much um, chemical gets removed by your, um, by your material of interest. And this gives you a good first pass um, you know, um, understanding of how much chemical has been removed. So here's some initial results. Um, over on the left, this is BPL. This is the baseline carbon that's used in current filters. It gets modified um, before it's actually used, but we wanted to kind of compare them apples to apples as much as possible. Um, versus three different materials that we've um, developed with MIT um, against five different chemicals. So CA, CK is cyanogen chloride, SO2 is sulfur dioxide, H2S is uh, hydrogen sulfide, GB is sarin, and GG, GD is somon. So these are actual chemical warfare agents. And what you can see is compared to the BPL, we've been able to modify these carbons in different ways to um, remove more of these chemicals than is used in the baseline carbon right now. So this is a great, this was one of the first results that we got within our lab that made us really think maybe we're onto something with these carbons. Um, and we need to start exploring these a lot more. So we started working with MIT and started saying, you know, what are the different variables that we can um, 
that we can tweak? What kind of things can we incorporate into these carbons? Um, how do we do things like um, change the uh, processing temperature and so forth? And they just started sending us a whole bunch of different samples. And this allowed us to look at things like tailorability. As you notice, all I did was put numbers of samples up here, and that's because I'm not trying to show you anything specific up here, but trying to show you about the tailorability. So we have probably a dozen different chemicals that we've exposed to these carbons, and all of the carbons react differently, um, which is really nice, because what that means is we are able to um, start to think about how we can tune and better understand what the carbon makeup is that we are creating and how that affects um, how it interacts with different chemicals of interest. Um, like I said before, one of the other things that we were interested in our lab were things like oxygen storage. So why is this important? Is if you think about a soldier who goes out there um, or potentially something like a, like a fireman or other first responder, um, they sometimes go in there with um, compressed air. Um, the compressed air um, has a, a limited capacity in the tank and there are ways to increase that and that's with a high surface area material. Um, so actually back to the slide, compared to an empty tank right here, that's our, our, our line that goes along the here in a straight line, um, a material like h cust one which is a high performing metal organic framework, um, we can more than double the capacity of, of a given tank. Um, when we compare HCUST1 to some of these biosniffs, one that was made by MIT and one that was made in our labs, um, we can see that they're very comparable. So again, this is a very promising result that we're able to get high surface area materials um, out, of, um, out of these carbons that we can use for storing oxygen. Um, we've also worked on engineering these materials, so getting them into, um, into fibers that we can then use for things like um, uh, uh, scarves for uh, low burden gas masks. We didn't think this was going to be as relevant as it is now. Obviously with the, the COVID response, um, this has a lot more relevance than it did two months ago. Um, so we are interested in seeing how these respond to things like uh, viral load and so forth. This was more meant for a low burden um, uh, thing that uh, a soldier would be able to bring with them. Um, and then if they think that there was some sort of chemical attack, potentially it's a, more used as an escape mask to kind of get out of danger quickly. So these got us thinking about things like, um, how do we process the material? So when we make these carbons, um, they're incredibly fluffy, um, which isn't really effective for their actual, um, their actual use in the field. So um, one of the things that we have to think about for filtration materials is first we have to pelletize them. Um, and then for things like getting them into the, um, into the fibers and materials, we have to think about polymer composites and how we process those to use to make things like decontamination wipes, uh, the filter-based fiber filtration that we were talking about, and potentially uh, protective suits down the line. Um, so what do we have to really do to get there? And one of the major answers is we have to be able to scale up these materials readily. So a lot of the materials that we were getting and testing from MIT, we would get you know, 20 to 50 milligrams at a time. This is not really enough material to be making um, really prototype materials or anything along those lines. So we had to start thinking about how to scale these up. Um, there's a lot out there right now on ways to scale things up from the bench top all the way up to commercial scale, but there seemed to be a real lack of people working in this middle ground, um, what we call the pilot scale that we were really interested in. So we realized that we were gonna need thousand liter fermentation to basically make kilograms of material. Um, and luckily at the Chem Bio Center, we were actually already well set up to do this. Um, so within our labs, what we've done already is we've gone, uh, the fermentation, we've done it up to a thousand liter scales and we get out um, the phage waste materials. Within the same vats, we can then do the polymerization up to thousand liters as well to get out large um, amounts of the poly polymeric material. We can then um, use a large scale tube furnace that we have to do the carbonization. Um, we've maximized our yield out right now at about 0.4 gram, grams per liter. Um, and that's based off of one of our 100 liter batches. We were able to get 40 grams worth of material out of. So now we're at enough material that we can start really thinking about doing real prototype type testing. Um, and we're working with some external partners to get us to uh, pelletize some of this material. Um, what this allows us to do, again, is prototype into things like gas mask filters, oxygen storage devices, 
in fiber-based technologies. And these are things that we're planning to do this fiscal year. So basically where we're at right now is we've got these jars of carbon ready to go and working with our partners to get us to prototyping uh, materials that we're ready to um, look and see actually how they work, not just their scientific performance. Um, so I want to take probably about a couple minutes here quickly at the end and talk about our, um, our scale-up capabilities. So one of the things that we quickly realized was that there's a bottleneck right now at this pilot scale production, not just for materials, but also for synthetic biology and biomanufacturing. Um, and the Chem Bio Center already had fermentation uh, equipment set up for uh, up to 1,000 liter batches. We also have 100 liter fermentation equipment and so forth. And we realized that put us in kind of a, a really unique position because this equipment did not exist within the DOD elsewhere. Um, what we didn't realize was it doesn't exist at a ton of places really at all across industry. So we had done kind of a market analysis, went through and looked at the different places to do this pilot scale level. And we talked to you know, different industrial partners um, who work in this area. We realized um, there are some places out there like uh, the ABPDU, which is obviously located really close to the EBRC, um, and they're probably the, the really the state-of-the-art folks who do this. Um, they go up to about 300 liters. Um, then there's the uh, MSU Institute, and they have a really nice facility as well. Um, but for the DOD capabilities that we need and for some of the projects we need, we would need to tie up some of these facilities for an entire year or for a long period of time. So it really made sense for us to develop this capability at the ChemBio Center as well. Um, we also have um, a lot of um, DOD partners like the Army, Navy, and Air Force who have interest in their own materials and things that for security reasons we might not want to be done outside of a government lab and might need to be done within DOD facilities. Um, so what we're doing is we're focusing on working on the, the pilot scale within uh, the Chem Bio Center. And then we will work with industrial partners down the road um, once we get to the level of actually wanting industrial scale production. Um, we got a recently just got approved for a $30 million investment over the next five years into the biological fermentation. So um, obviously we already have a lot of the fermentation equipment, but we need to invest in a lot of our downstream uh, processing and purification. Um, and we're also looking to invest into new talent. So at the Chem Bio Center right now, we are looking for new folks who have interest in biological fermentation scale up in downstream processing and uh, things along those lines. So especially after this talk, if anyone wants to talk about that, we're interested. Um, real quick, since I, I know I'm running short on time here, um, a couple of my other kind of just sidebars on materials development. Basically we need to, uh, for materials development in biomanufacturing and synthetic biology, it's a lot more difficult than just the design build, test, learn, life cycles. Um, if you just think about design, build, test, learn into making your man biomanufacturing materials, we also have to think about how can we think about high throughput ways of performance, uh, analyzing the materials and characterizing their performance and so forth. Um, how do we develop that into modeling and machine learning? And then once we even make good materials, we have to think about how we engineer those form factors. Um, so design, build, test, learn is a lot more complicated for materials than it is just for biomolecules, and I think that's important to, to realize that there's not really a great platform for this right now. Becky, I caught you out of the corner of my eye. Did you say you still had three minutes? Good, I only have two slides. Um, so um, uh, the, the one thing that I really think that needs to be, that's really lacking across, um, across the enterprise, with Symbio Enterprise, is the materials performance and characterization piece. Um, I know there are some individual folks who are working on high throughput spectroscopy, high throughput AFM and things along those lines. Those are things that are super important into thinking about how SynBio can play a role in material science and need to be better integrated right now um, in a much more holistic way. Um, especially things like dynamic characterization, things that can be done in real time on materials that are developed. So if we think about biology, how it can really work in a high throughput manner, the characterization and the performance is way behind in the speed um, compared to how um, samples can actually be made. Um, this is true for performance as well. You can think about uh, reactivity assays, uh, different types of testing, things like water permeation and so forth. Um, so just something, this is just kind of like my own editorial, um, but 
these are things that are super important in my, from my perspective uh, for the progression of synthetic biology and material science. So with that, I want to take uh, obviously a minute to thank um, not just our funders. Usually I don't even call out the funders by name, but I'll tell you what, the program managers at DARPA are fantastic. Um, so anyone who's ever worked with them on the Thousand Molecule program or anything else, will know how well integrated they are into your programs and actually provide great scientific input. Um, at the ChemBio Center, we have the ChemBio Filtration Team. Uh, Greg Peterson has been helping lead a lot of this effort, um, and a lot of people who have done a lot of the testing are listed there as well. Uh, in the biosciences, uh, Peter Emanuel is our ST uh, for biotechnology. He's led a lot of these efforts. Uh, and Christina Hess actually went out to my MIT and brought a lot of the knowledge back to the ChemBio Center for us. Um, has really been integral in helping um, go from uh, taking the knowledge at MIT and really helping ChemBio Center um, really take this to the next level. Um, and of course, the folks at MIT who have helped out a lot in NG Belcher's lab. I'd be happy to take any questions from you guys.